continue in this message series entitled The Gift. And for those of you who may not have been here uh, for the previous parts and for the previous weeks and have missed it, this is a series where I'm focusing in on what the Magi or the wise men did, the gifts that they brought to Jesus. But more than just information I want to share with you, my prayer today is as we go through this message that you will truly, honestly, on the very front end, before I get to any details, will have the attitude in the heart of, God, will you show me where I'm at in this story? Because if if we're here and all I do is give you information, I failed collectively, we've not hit the mark, and we've walked away maybe a little bit smarter, but we've not really come to a place of change in our hearts and our lives. And so as we get into this, again, my hope is that you're truly longing to see and hear from God. And by the way, he will answer that prayer. God, will you speak to me? He will. That if you'll do that, that we'll leave this place with a better understanding of how we can more clearly and perfectly worship God in our imperfection. And so this is the gift, part number three. We've been looking at the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. These were leaders from far off an eastern land that followed a star to Jesus, and they brought with them gifts, three gifts, that were of equal value, or pretty close to being equal value. We know that they were very expensive. They also had practical means to them. What what they brought was not just symbolic, but it was something that they could actually use in their daily life, and it was very culturally uh, a standard thing that was being used throughout that day and age. But more importantly, all of these gifts that were brought, they spiritually and prophetically pointed in the future to either who Jesus was or what he was going to do for us. And so the first gift that we talked about in part one is frankincense, which is scraped away from a tree. It's the resin of a tree, and it has a beautiful fragrance to it, very sweet smelling. And it's used in many different forms and for many different things. But what we know of through the Old Testament and the way that they primarily use frankincense, it was a liquid form. And they used it in burnt offerings and in the holy place as a fragrance. Kind of picture one of those uh, candles, those uh, oil dispersing candles or whatever it is that you put those heaters. And it brings a beautiful scent and aroma into the room. You, You light the candle or you plug it in and it changes the environment. Well, that's what frankincense was, and it points to the worship that Jesus would receive and the worship that he deserves. And so Jesus is one to be worshiped. Last week we talked about myrrh. Myrrh, much like frankincense, comes from a tree, from the sap, but it's very different. It's not sweet smelling. It's kind of piney and a little bit bitter. And they use it among many things. They use it for embalming bodies. And so by giving myrrh to Jesus, it was signifying that he would be our suffering servant, that one day he he would die. He would be killed for us as a sacrifice so that we could experience eternal and true life. And so frankincense and myrrh worship and pointing to Jesus being our sacrifice. Today, we are looking at gold. Now, this one doesn't need a lot of explanation. Culturally, we understand what gold is. We know it's precious. We know it's, uh, at times, it is scarce. And it's a metal that we have. Now, I have a bag here full of not real gold, but of uh, fool's gold. I'm obviously not going to bring chunks of gold (laughs) to church. A, I don't have the money, and B, I don't trust any of you. So, no. (laughs) I leave my props up here in between services. I don't trust you guys. And uh, I have no idea who's tampering with things. But when I got this in the mail, this fool's gold, I took a chunk of it, and I gave it to our worship leader's daughter. And uh, she's just a sweetheart, and um, it's so cute. She's missing her two front teeth, so that's all she wants for Christmas. But I gave this to her because she loves stones. And I told her as I'm handing it, this is not real gold. It's fool's gold. Like, right away, I was just going to burst her bubble. But you should have seen her eyes get so big. And she's like, it sparkles. (laughs) She's just, like, mesmerized by it. Well, we may not all do that as as kids, but we certainly do that as adults. We like the jewelry. We like when people give us stuff. Ladies, you like uh, when guys go out and buy that for you or you buy it for yourself. And so we know what gold is. We know, for the most part, it's not too much of an unknown factor like myrrh and frankincense is. 
But really, gold was royal, and gold was expensive, and therefore it was a gift fit for a king. And so as they gave this gift of gold, they were marking and declaring the kingship of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. For at just the right time, Christ the, uh, just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the king of all kings and Lord of all lords. And so here is Jesus who is coming supreme over all kings and over all lords. Gold represents and is a symbol of his kingship here on this earth and really for that matter for eternity. So In looking at this, still remembering the gold, the kingship of Jesus, there were several different responses, in fact, four, that people had to the kingship of Jesus Christ. Four responses, and I believe not only are we going to look at their response, but I believe this this is how our response is often as well. And maybe you'll find yourself in one or two or all of these in your life. The first response to the kingship of Jesus was aggressive opposition. Aggressive opposition. King Herod, the ruler of the land at that day and age when Jesus was born, uh, was very insecure. He was full of, he was a sinner. He was worldly in every sense of the word and uh, every sense of the word. And so he did not like the idea of a king of all kings coming and usurping his authority. In his mind, the way kings work, uh, kingships raised, raised and fell, was you're a king, you battle, and you, whoever wins takes the prize. You know, literally, like, if you, they didn't really have elections back in the day. It wasn't like it was popular vote or anything like that. It was do or die. And you have to fight for your kingdom. And everybody out there that's not with you is against you. And if you don't know where they're at, that means they're against you. And so King Herod is aggressively opposed to Jesus. Read here in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. This This is the part of the story where the wise men are now leaving Jesus, going back to their land. Because what happened was as kings, the wise men, the magi, many know them as kings, before they went to go see Jesus, they first went to go speak to the king. It was a a matter of honor. We're kings. We're in your kingdom. We're going to talk to the king. And they said, hey, we're here because we've been following this star. We are here to see this king, this savior of the world. And Herod didn't know anything about it. He's a little bit kicked back on his heels. And so he begins to say like, well, what are you talking about? And they begin to explain it to him. He says, well, hey, I don't know where he's at because they were asking basically for directions. Do you know where Jesus is at? King Herod did not. He is, so King Herod, thinking he's smart, is, said something along the lines of, well, why don't you go find them and come back and report to me so I can go find this king and worship him as well? That certainly was not his heart. That, but they perceived and they understood what the king was doing. They leave his presence to go find Jesus. And King Herod begins to pull in all of his uh, leaders and scribes, trying to ask them, where is this child at? The one that would dethrone me. I want to find him and I want to get rid of him. And they did not know. It says here in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, this is after the wise men left, it says Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise man's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. That's speaking about Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. It's really easy to mow through this scripture and be like, oh, okay, cool. So, you know, they didn't find Jesus. That's great. You'll find in further scriptures that Jesus uh, escaped. You got to understand, Herod sent his soldiers to kill all of the two-year-old and younger boys. So it's real easy to kind of fluff through this story. We're like, Jesus and the nativity and wise men. Herod was slaughtered two-year-old and younger boys. Okay? Brutal. But he could not find Jesus. He was furious at the wise men. And the reason why uh, 
he said two years and younger is because of the report the wise men gave. They said, basically, I mean, I'm interpreting here a little bit, but two years ago, the star appeared. And that means they took a two-year journey to get there. So Jesus probably wasn't an infant. He was somewhere around two years old, a toddler. And so in that, Herod says, well, I don't know where this Jesus guy is, so we're going to kill everybody. That's two years of age and younger. I, uh, we, we have this community dinner coming up, and we want to get the word out the best that we can. And we have flyers and all these kind of things. But one of the things that we do is Facebook ads. Uh, you know those things that you hate and you scroll past and you always wonder who's, who's putting these ads up? Well, that's me. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, we want to get the word out for those who may not follow our Facebook page. We want to deliver a meal or have that picked up and just share the love of God with them. And so I go ahead a few weeks ago and I put in our Facebook ads and hit submit. I get an email back that says, your ad's been approved. I'm like, yes, all right, cool. I can move on to the next thing. And about a few days into it, I get a, a message from one of the people that help with our social media. And they said, hey, like, what do you want us to do with all these comments? Well, what are you talking about? They said, go on the event and look at the comments that people are putting in. And I start looking at the comments and it is off the rails. I mean, they're saying things like all these, you know, these, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm just paraphrasing, but brutal stuff. It was things along the lines of, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about and they're hypocrites and, and, you know, you know, Christians just bury their heads in the sand basically. And they don't believe in science. They don't believe in truth. And Christianity falls apart when you start speaking truth. And they're just mean, like they're just lighting us up. All comments on a community dinner event page. Like here, we're here to show you the love of God. And apparently we're all ignorant and buck tooth and backwards. So like, so they're just laying into us. I'm like, what is the deal? So I start clicking on some of these profiles and every single one of them is from California. I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? Uh, you guys got nothing better than to do than just light me up on Facebook? What's your problem here? Come to find out, do a little bit of research. And I had a setting wrong in the Facebook ads. Instead of clicking on the Mason County surrounding region, I had it clicked on all of America. And so, so for those of you that are uh, volunteering to drive, we have a few Nebraska rounds we got to do. We got a few Alaska. Was a kid? No, I'm just joking. No, so obviously I fixed the issue. We deleted the comments because we don't really want that to be our first impression. Oh, I'm, I need a meal. And also you guys are a bunch of morons. So like we didn't want that to be our first impression. So long story short, I found out real quick and I knew this, but this was a good reminder that maybe, just maybe, in Ludington, the surrounding region, we live in quite a bit of a Christian bubble. Not that everybody's Christian, but we're certainly not nearly as hostile to the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ as, say, a place like California. And, I mean, just a few days, and they were furious. And so... I'm thankful for that, but we also have to remind ourselves that the perspective that we hold, the worldview, is not even close to what everybody in this world holds. Herod was aggressively opposing Jesus, trying to murder him. There are people out there, their heart position and response to King Jesus, the message of follow Jesus is aggression and opposition. They hate him. They hate the message, they hate the church, they hate religion, they hate all of it. And they have their reasons. Some of them are legit. They've been hurt by other people, I mean, at least legitimate in their own mind. They still need to be healed from that. And certainly we as Christians can do a better job representing Jesus. We've not always done a great job of that, which turns people off to a relationship with Jesus. But by and large, people still have their decisions they have to make, and some of them hate God. And by the way, side note, if they hate Jesus... They also should hate you because you should sound like and act like Jesus being that you're his disciple. If they're going to hate Jesus, they're going to hate you, the word tells us. And so there is these positions of people who absolutely hate God and his word. Now, I'm not a fighter. I've never been in a real fight. I've wrestled with my brothers and my father and my kids, wrestled all the time, but I've never actually been in a real fight. There's a small part of me that kind of wants to get in one just to say I've been in one, but I've never been in a real fight. I mean, like a knockdown drag out, like it's go time. And I know I shouldn't, but I kind of want to, you know, there's, a, there's that part until you're getting just whomped on and you're like, I don't like this. So I don't really know what like an attack 
position is, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not a fighter. I don't know. It's certainly not this, like, put him up, you know, <laughs> come at me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know, but like an attack position. I don't know, just brass knuckles on, just here we go, an attack position. That's the, if you will, the physical representation of some people's hearts towards God and Jesus, our king. I'm going to fight him. I hate him. Everything he stands for, I am against, you know, and they'll say things and much more like what they said in our Facebook. They'll say things like, well, who are you to tell me? You don't have the truth. That's your truth. My truth is something different. Religion is just an opioid of the masses. You guys are all just trying to cope with society and your life just like the rest of us. They'll say things like we're weak and we're ignorant and we're deniers of facts and science. They'll call us a bunch of hypocrites, whatever. Like, I mean, whatever angle they can hit it from. And all they're doing, we, we feel the punches. They feel like they're landing on us. But really what they're doing is they're just punching at God. They're just fighting him. And they're attacking him aggressively in opposition to him. That position, I'm assuming, is probably not anybody in here. It could be a wrong assumption and even watched online. I mean, maybe there's someone online right now like, yeah, I think you guys are a bunch of lunatics. Well, just watch for a few more minutes. And if we are, you can turn it off. And if not, then maybe God has something to share with you. But so most of us, I'm preaching to the choir, probably aren't in the aggressive opposition fight God kind of face. So let's look at the second one. And just so we can understand that was King Herod. Now let's look at the priests and what they did. Number two, a way of responding to God, Jesus as our king, is arrogant dismissal. See, the priests, they knew the prophetic words. They knew it front words and back. They probably actually knew it better than the wise men. The wise men and magi weren't even necessarily Jews. They weren't even following the Messiah, or, or they weren't in that religion at all. Most likely, they were completely outside of it. They were just following prophetic words that were given and a sign that was in the sky. But the priests and the religious leaders, they had all of the information at their disposal. So this idea that if I just know more about God, somehow that's going to get me into the presence of God, get me into a relationship, and somehow it's going to change my life. It just knowing more information doesn't do anything for you. It has to be applied. It has to be owned by you and loved by you. And so here you go. You have these priests. They had all these prophetic words in Isaiah and other places. This is one of them is in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judea. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. This is one of many where they had all of human history leading up to this moment, and they missed it. They had all the information. They weren't even that far away. They were a little over five miles, something like 5.2 or 5.3 miles away from Bethlehem. That's how far it is to Jerusalem. Not even that big of a journey, certainly closer than the wise men. And yet they did not come. They weren't even curious. I would at least be curious. Why in the world is this brand new star in the sky? They didn't even bother. They had all their rituals and all their sacrifices, and all the things that was important to them, and they dismissed this new Jesus king above all kings that has been born. They dismissed him. And what that looks like is selectively choosing when you're going to submit. When it's convenient to you, and when it lines up with what you believe and what you want in your life. And that's what it's like to be a priest in this example. Because they were serving God. It's not like they didn't know who God was. It wasn't like they weren't in covenant with God. They were the people of God, Jews. They were there. But there was this part of them that because Jesus did not show up the way that they anticipated, in other words, what they believed, what they were longing for, because he did not show up like a prince riding on a white horse with a sword in his hand ready to destroy all the enemies of God. He didn't come in with all the power, and the pomp, and the circumstance, and he didn't come in with an army. He came in the exact opposite because Jesus did not line up with what they believed. They chose not to inconvenience themselves to even see what in the world was going on. They selectively, as religious people, chose 
what they wanted and what they did not want to do, what was important and what was not worth their time. Think of it like this. If, if the aggressive stance is like this, so you're going to fight somebody, this would be more, the dismissal would be more like my back turned to you. This is root. This is disengaging. This is me telling you non-verbally, even though I'm speaking it, that you're not important to me. That whatever you're doing is what you're doing, and I've got something more important than I'm looking at here. It's awkward, to say the least. I mean, this is not how you give a presentation. This is not how you preach a message with your back to people. And yet, this is what the priest did to Jesus, arrogant dismissal of him. And this is oftentimes what we will do to Jesus as well. Because we feel like we know better. We feel like our way is better. We're smarter. We have more insight than what God does. His word is maybe out of touch or out of tune. Maybe you missed it. And it, our plan is going to be the one that we go with. It's the one that we choose. Think about it. It's, there's areas in our lives, and this is not holistically oftentimes, there's just certain areas that we have as believers, and we say to God, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll follow you in other areas, but not in this area. Like right now, you guys are here at church or you're watching online. That's awesome. But you might, you might be fully engaged with God by being here, but you might have your back turned to him arrogantly, pridefully dismissing God when it comes to the area of giving or to the area of serving other people or serving at a church or a ministry where we are to be more blessed when we give than we are when we receive. It may be something along the lines where, you, you listen, you've been given and you've been serving, but you're not going to give God daily devotions. That means time spent with God where you read his word and you worship and you pray and talk with him because honestly, you're busy and you've got a lot going on and you've got to hit the day running. And so church is church and I'll do that really well, but I'm not going to spend today and tomorrow and the next day with God. What you're doing is selectively choosing when you're going to accept God, church, and when you're going to turn your back on God and say no for daily devotions. The same thing with godly lifestyle and how you live your life. You can be spending every single moment with God in the presence of God all day long, but all of a sudden when you get around other people and they're pressuring you to do things that you shouldn't do or look at things or say things that you shouldn't say, and you go, you know what? Honestly, God, I like my friends. We have a good time together. We like to hang out. My coworkers, man, they're so funny. And also we just turn our back like the priest. It's not convenient. You know, not right now, God, it's not for me. And you can lay it down any other way you want. And for any other topic, for some people, they truly love God and they truly spend time with him, but they won't dedicate the beginning of the week in time spent with other believers. And that can be here. That can be in community groups. That can be online to the best of our ability. They won't spend that time. They're all in with the things of God. And yet, even though the word tells us not to forsake the assembling of the brother, we somehow know better. And so this is what we do. We're in this kind of, ah, ah, da, da. And we get in that rhythm of dismissing because of our pride, God, and turning our back on him. Obviously, fighting against God is sinful, but so is turning our back and dismissing God. These hurt our relationship. These actions and thoughts and words bring a chasm and make it bigger between us and God. I'm not talking about salvation because that's a gift from God, but I'm talking about your relationship with him. Number three, Absolute worship should really be where all of us are at. This is the third response that we see in the story of Jesus being born to the kingship, the kingship reality of Jesus is absolute worship. And that's where we get it from the Magi. Now, we also get it from the shepherds, too, but they're just not a part of the story right now. That's not part of the message. The shepherds were awesome. They were there with complete worship as well. But the Magi, the focus of this story, they came and they did something that was terribly unexpected. Matthew chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, 
We read it today during worship, and we've read it every single week during this message series. But when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him, and they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gifts part is cool because it's something natural, and we can kind of attach our imagination to that, but we have to take a step back and realize the most important thing that happened in that moment. These kings, full of all the power and the influence, who in any circumstances could have just said, hey, let's just send the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We'll FedEx it to Jesus. It'll get there. A nice card. I'll even sign it. I'll come up, you know, like it'll be nice and they'll appreciate it. These guys, they traveled two years, most scholars believe. Two years from them, either traveled or were in the process of traveling. They saw the stars, they put it all together, they planned their trip, and they went off on the trip. Two years of travel, and then probably most likely one to two years to travel back. So this is a multi-year commitment these guys did, while most likely on camels. I don't know if you've ever seen a camel. They're smelly, and they're hairy, and they're hot, and they're grumpy. So like... I don't know what your drive into church was today, but I guarantee it was better than that. And so these kings get there and they give their gifts, which is beautiful and that's to be remembered. But then they do something which would never be expected. They bow down, most likely getting down. They remember they have robes on, they have these, they're, they're, they're royal garments. And they bow down before God. A toddler, remember. Like, not the beautiful baby that we remember in all our porcelain nativity scenes that sit on top of the bookshelf. I, this is most likely a two year old toddler. He's all like, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> like <laughs> Jesus was fully God. You guys have to remember that. You gotta loosen up a little bit. And he was fully human. And so Jesus is there as a one, two year old toddler, and these kings are bowing down before him. And if you bow down, your crown's going to fall off. So they're taking their crown off to bow down. All symbolic, all beautiful, all important, because in doing so, they are lowering themselves, thereby elevating Jesus. Now, I, w- I filmed last week live at a barn where we had a bunch of sheep, had a fun time. It was freezing cold, but we had a great time. But like any barn... There is straw down, not because it looks good, but because there is mud and feces everywhere. And my shoes, they took one for the team, okay? (laughs) That's all I gotta say. Like Davis, my video guy that was with us, he got out of the vehicle and he had trash bags over his boots. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, it's gonna be bad. And eventually he took them off, but I understand why, because poor Davis, the intern, on Monday, he had to take all the equipment apart, all the cables, all the light stands, all the tripods, and wipe every single one of them down because there were sheep feces all over everything. You guys starting to get the picture? Yeah. These kings in the filth bowed down before Jesus, crowns removed, robes soaking in with what's going, with that's on the ground. Because they were most likely in in like a manger or a barn or a a cave. We don't quite know what the structure was, but we know it was, it was the place where animals were. They're they're in this, this robes are soaking it up and they're, they smell and they're filthy. Can you imagine, and you could pick any country you want. Could you imagine a king or a queen or a president or a ruler from anywhere coming together, that, that alone is pretty incredible, but coming together and sitting in an active barn bowed down before a toddler going, this is the one that has been prophesied of. This is the one that is going to be the king above all of us, including us kings. Unbelievable what took place. So respectfully, gold, frankincense, and myrrh was one of the cheapest acts of worship that these magi had and did for Jesus. And so that is the complete worship. That is the absolute surrender to Jesus. To remove our crowns, to bow down low, and to worship God. 
The highest form of worship is to bow yourself low. Now, I'm not always saying physically that you bow yourself. Of course, you can do that. Many times, not always, but most times during worship, I'll, I'll, I'll bow before God. I'll, I'll get on my knees. And I do that because before I get up here to share the holy word of God with you, it is a physical reminder and a spiritual reminder to me that this is not about me. This is not about Radiant Church. It is not about the band. It is not about the live stream. This is all for you, Jesus. You receive the glory and honor. Amen? And so I'll physically do that during worship many times, but that's for me. It has nothing to do with you guys. It's only for me. It's between me and my Heavenly Father. And so I'm not saying that to have absolute worship of God that you physically have to bow down, although there's something very practical and also very spiritual about naturally doing what your heart condition is also doing, reflecting outwardly what's happening inwardly. But whether it be physically bowing or spiritually bowing before God, we need to be in absolute worship to God, crowns removed, humbled into the filth of ourselves, knowing that God is the one that raises us up. He is the one that's worthy of our life, of our praise, of the breath in our lungs, and our aspirations and our dreams should all belong to him. Amen. Jesus did not want to go to the cross the way that he did. He pleaded with God the Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me, from other than being murdered the way that he was. But then he said, nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. So even Jesus, while on this earth, submitted to God the Father. And so Jesus now, after being crucified and being raised from the dead, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. For the rest of eternity, we'll have all of us, the elders, all of us as spirit beings, the creatures, all angels in heaven for the rest of eternity bow down continually in the throne room of heaven in praise and worship, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Amen, Amen right? So there's this, there's this rhythm to this thing where we had better figure it out here on this short wisp of a life that we have now of what it means to fully aban be abandoned in worship towards Jesus because that's all we're going to be doing in heaven. So you better figure it out now or at least start kind of liking to worshiping God now because if you don't like it, you're going to hate heaven. Now, it's a joke, but you know what I'm saying? Like, guys, th this life that we have, it's but a vapor, the word tells us, compared to eternity. And so that complete surrender and worship towards God, that means whatever you say, God, I will do it immediately, and I will do it fully. I've heard it said this way, that delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience. So in other words, God tells you to do it. And you're like, oh, I'm not sure. And you just wait for a while and you still do it. That's still disobedience. It's still a measure of sin. And so I worship you. I surrender. I give you reverence immediately and fully. Now, none of us live that life perfectly. It, there's not a human being on this earth that has ever, for, the, for their entire existence, spiritually lived in this posture towards God. We make mistakes. We mess up. We get distracted. Just like last week, we are like sheep wandering around, just trying to figure things out. It happens. But there is the grace of God for us. That if we will humble ourselves, crown off, bow before the Lord spiritually, if we will humble ourselves, let go of our pride and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I have been disobedient. I have been sinful. I've done it my own way. Will you forgive me? I worship you. I praise you. You alone deserve my life. Every time that we do that, we have a promise from God that if we will humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness, that he is faithful every single time to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, and to bring forth life on the inside of us where we allow there to be death. And so this posture of crown off in a bowed down low position is truly the highest form of worship to God. 
Luke chapter 14, verse 11 says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. You puff yourself up. You say, I got it. I have it all figured out. God, I don't need you. I can do it on my own. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. There is a big difference between you choosing to humble yourself and God humbling you. If you've ever been humbled by God, not fun, <laughs> right? Like we should be those that daily, moment by moment, humble ourselves so that we can be exalted, that Jesus is the one that exalts us, our king, and not ourselves. Hopefully, your heart condition and the trajectory of your life is aimed in that direction. So again, we have the first one. The first response to King Jesus is aggressive opposition, the second one is arrogant dismissal. The third one is absolute worship. Now I could end right there, bring out the pianist, let's play some music and we're good to go. But I believe that there truly is a fourth response. And this is the one I actually feel the vast majority of us probably have a tendency to fall into more than any of the others. Again, I don't think anybody in this room or maybe online is aggressively opposing God. I think there's probably times where we follow our convenience and we selectively choose when we want to follow Jesus and when we want to dismiss him. This probably happens quite often. We need to deal with that in our lives. Hopefully, again, the direction, the anthem of our life continues to move in the direction of bowing down and worshiping God. But I believe the fourth condition is one that is running rampant in our society, and it's probably more likely where we're at, and it's apathetic indifference. You know, the story of the innkeeper is really short. It's not really expounded upon too much. We find it here in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly with strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because... There was no lodging available for them. And so we know that, again, Jesus was placed um, in a manger. He was most likely in a barn or a cave of some sort, definitely a working farm, you know, where there's animals and there's crops and things like that. This was the outbuilding. This was uh, a part of an innkeeper's business. And so they came looking for a room. There was no room because there was a census being called. The hotel was filled, if you will, no vacancy. And so all they had left to them was the garage, was the barn, wherever it is, the outbuilding. By the way, side note, um, that's not a great Yelp reveal if you are a bed and breakfast owner. We're the ones that denied the birth of save our Savior, Jesus Christ. One star. <laughs> like, you know, you don't, you don't want that Yelp review. But this innkeeper was very seldom talked about, and we just kind of forget about him. He's not really part of the story. It's about the wise men, and it's about the shepherds, and it's about Jesus and Mary and, and Joseph and all those things, and, and it really is. But I think the innkeeper actually has a pretty important role to play in all of this. We have no record of the innkeeper worshiping Jesus. None whatsoever. He could have. I'm, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a leap, a little bit of assumption, but we have no record of it. I mean, if the Bible took painstaking effort to include the shepherds in the field, he probably would track down that there was other people there too. But all we know about was the Magi and the shepherds. And so we have no, worship, no record of, him being, of Jesus being worshipped by the innkeeper. But it doesn't mean that he didn't exist. And it doesn't mean that he wasn't a part of what was going on. Remember, the innkeeper... While there was no room for them in their business, which I understand, they were full, you know, uh, when he said, you can go and use my barn, you can use the outbuilding here, this was an active farm. This was an active lifestyle. This is their income. This is, it wasn't just a random building that they had. And so this innkeeper probably was exposed and in the presence of Jesus and around him and Mary and Joseph multiple times a day. You know, you go out there to feed the cows and the sheep and to clean up and to give water and you're doing all the good things that you should be doing because you have this, these animals and you have this building, so you got to keep it up. And he, here you go, you just got this child that was born 
and a feeding trough, most likely, wrapped up in strips of cloth, he was around Jesus quite a bit. And yet, we have no record of him worshiping. I mean, what a beautiful story to say that the, that the, the social outcasts, the shepherds were brought into Jesus. The kings were brought into Jesus. Business owners were brought to Jesus. But there's no record of him doing that. And I believe that that indifference, if it was there, and I believe it was, I believe that that indifference, apathy, whatever word you want to use for that, I believe it is something that runs rampant in today's society. And I, this next part that I'm going to say might be offensive because what we're dealing with in reality right now, but just hear my heart on it. It's not offensive. I believe that apathy and indifference towards Jesus, our King, is a pandemic in the American Christian church. And I use that with a lot of sensitivity, knowing that a pandemic that we're in right now, a natural one, a pandemic is spread out of control. It is something that ruins lives. It kills people. A pandemic is not what you want to be in. And yet, I believe spiritually, the American church is probably more like the innkeeper, apathetic and indifference to, indifferent towards Jesus, our King, than probably any other person involved in this story. Because it's out of control. Our lives are, for the most part, so good and at least comfortable enough where we, don't, we haven't been pushed into a place of action that we can take or leave Jesus. He's a good add-on accessory. And so the position, the physical position is not an attack. It's not dismissal. It's not bowing before Jesus. But the position of that is, I would say, honestly, probably sideways. Jesus, I know you're there. I have peripheral vision. I can see all of you guys. I know you're there. I'm aware of it. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I love you, Jesus. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I follow you. But I'm still following my direction. You're there. I'm, I'm not blind. But you're not my focus. It's just giving someone the cold shoulder. It's this indifference. I'm not against you. I'm not dismissing you like you don't know what you're talking about, God. I'm not worshiping you. I'm just kind of existing with you. It's a meh kind of response to Jesus. This sideways interaction with him. And it looks different for different people. And so this certainly is not an exhausted list. This is just how I've been at times. Where I go to church, so I'm, I'm, I can see God. I go to church, but I have no expectation, expectation whatsoever of God moving. I just showed up, did my thing, checked the box, listened to the worship, jetted out. No desire, no prayer, no intention of God, meet me in this place. This is holy ground. God, I desire for your power and your presence to be made known in my life, for you to change me so that I can go and change the world for you. We just walk in, walk out, and don't expect anything from God. Again, I know you're there, but you're just not my priority. You're not my focus. You're, you're part of my life. For some of us, it looks like the fact that we own a Bible or Bibles that are mostly unread and collecting dust. Again, I got a Bible. I'm not against you. I don't hate you. I'm not dismissing you, God, but I've got some more important things over here. I don't have time for this. I got time for my life. I don't got time for this. Could look like you only pray to God in times of deep distress or trouble. The only time that you ever reach out to God is when everything is falling apart and the wheels are coming off your life. And certainly he hears that prayer. He cares about you. He loves you. He bottles up all your tears, the word tells us, and he numbers every hair on your head. Yes, guys, he knows how to subtract. So <laughs> as the years go on, I mean, I'm fine. I'm not, this ain't going anywhere. But so we got a rock solid hairline. So it's okay to pray to God in times of need. Like you don't have to feel like you can't do that. But if that's the only time that we talk to God, the only time that we fellowship with him and, and meet with him and worship him is when we just want to get something from him. That's just saying, God, listen, I have my life. When things get real bad, I'll turn over here real quick. But honestly, this is, this is kind of where I'm going to invest my time and my energy is right over here. 
I love you, but I really love that. It might look different for you. People close to you at work, friends, family members, who literally would have a hard time believing that you're a follower of Jesus. Maybe they don't even know that you're a Christian. Why? Because you've kept it to yourself. You don't talk about it. It's not important. Or possibly the way that you live your life is the exact opposite of the way a Christian should live their life. And therefore, your actions undermine your, what you say you believe. Either way, if there's people around you that are either struggling to know that you're a Christian to begin with, or they're struggling to understand how you're any different than the rest of the world that doesn't know Jesus, that's a problem. It's like, I've got the name badge. I'm a Christian. I, I checked the box on the census. I got it. But I'm not going to tell people about you, Jesus, because I'm honestly a little bit ashamed. They might reject me. They might think I'm crazy. They might be from California. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but not fully here. You guys are tracking with me. You show up to church or to community groups or events to receive from God. God, I need, I need to be filled up, which is great. It's beautiful. But you never get to the point where you pour out out of the abundance of your heart to other people. You've freely received, now you should freely give. Again, God, I just give it all to me. And my pocket's right here. Fill my pocket up. Give me everything you got. But I'm going to spend it all over here. I'm going to invest my life, my talent, my treasure, and my time over here. But I want you to keep filling me up. So it may be those, it may be something completely different in your life, but I truly believe the sideways apathetic indifference towards God is like the innkeeper is probably more reality of where we're really at. Oftentimes, maybe I'm speaking for myself. Maybe this is hitting you smack dab square in the eyes. So what kind of king is this? We have this gold that represents the kingship of God here on this earth. So what kind of king is Jesus? Because our response to that question matters greatly. How do we handle the presence of the king in our midst? Remember that Jesus did not come like anybody expected. Not, there was zero anticipation for how he came into this world. Now, if people were paying attention to the prophetic words, they would have understood that actually the way he came lines 100% up with what was told about him. But what they wanted was what every other kingdom had. A ruler, a victor, a champion, someone that would destroy enemies and build kingdoms, natural ones here on this earth. That's what they wanted. And so when Jesus came in a very unexpected way, what kind of king is this? A king that is born out of wedlock. A king that is poor, comes from no means, no influence whatsoever. A king who had to grow up in a very normal, subpar kind of life and environment in town. Who had to learn how to be, how to be, have any skills and any trades from his stepfather. His parents weren't even, like, he didn't even have full mom, full dad. He had a stepdad. What kind of king comes here on this earth to be laughed and ridiculed at? to serve and to heal the blind and to give life to the people that have died, that have come to feed the poor and the people that have been rejected. What kind of king befriends tax collectors and prostitutes and sits down with them and eats with them and spends time in their household? What kind of king walks from point A to point B never expecting the luxuries of life? says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What kind of king picks 12 yahoos to be his disciples? I mean, these guys weren't educated. They weren't the cream of the crop. And yet he said, come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. What kind of king goes from town to town to town, sometimes being celebrated, sometimes being rejected, and ran out of town? He just ran out of his own hometown because they just saw him as Joseph's son. What kind of king in the midst of crookedness would uphold righteousness? 
and choose not to bow down. So that when he walked in the temple and he saw that there was just money changers and business taking place and unholy things taking place in a holy environment, he takes a table and he flips it over because this is not godly and this is not right. What kind of king intentionally ticks off all of the religious leaders and is politically incorrect? Most of our kings and presidents try to appease all as many groups as they possibly can so they can get that vote. What kind of king allows himself to be beaten and whipped, to be crushed, to be spat upon, to be stripped naked, to be rejected, to be marched down in a parade of shame, to be falsely accused, tortured in all that he does, eventually killed on a cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. None of this speaks of an earthly king, but what this speaks of is truly the king of all kings, humbled himself, emptied himself from heaven to come here to serve us, to live on this earth, to show us his love, to understand what we have gone through. The word tells us we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand what we're going through. He has gone through all of this earning the right to be called King of Kings and Lord of Lords because there's not a single human being that would ever do that for people that hated them. Amen? And so gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it doesn't hold a candle to the true worth and the true value of Jesus Christ. And so taking just a few moments, the slide up here on the screen has all four different kinds of responses. Aggressive opposition, arrogant dismissal, complete worship, absolute in how we worship God, and apathetic indifference. Which one are you? Now, let me just key in on something. Chances are you aren't any of them. You're not fully one or the other. This is not all or nothing. You're not like, oh, well, I'm obviously number three. Like, that's not, like, that's not the goal. I'm not, I'm not creating another disc profile or something like that, trying to categorize, all right, I need all of the rank, heathen, aggressive opposition over here, and I need all of the full worshipers over here. I'm not trying to divide and conquer or anything like that. Because the reality is, chances are, in the different areas of our lives, we respond to the kingship of Jesus differently. There may be areas in our lives that we are truly, if we're honest, violently opposed to God. At the same time, there might be areas in our lives where we're completely abandoned in worshiping Him and at, with absolute worship. Areas in our life where we're indifferent and apathetic towards Jesus. Area in our life where we just dismiss what His Word says. Because it's usually not all or nothing but the reality is, is, if we're doing anything other than absolute worship and bowing down before Jesus, those areas are sinful. And so with no one looking around, every eye closed, I want to take just a moment. And I want you to do the vulnerable thing. And this is not at all for me. This is for you. Between you and God. And ask the Holy Spirit, if he's not done so already, to reveal to you what area, where you're at in these responses to Jesus. It may not be an audible voice. It might just be like God connecting the dots, like, oh, he's talking about this. Oh, you're definitely this way when it comes to this area of your life. I'm going to stop talking because I want you to legitimately ask God, and I want you to hear from God. My hope is, is that God shared with you, revealed to you what's going on in your own heart, where you're really at. 
If you don't feel like you've gotten that, it's okay. You haven't missed God. He'll speak to you. Trust me, that is a prayer that he answers. If you're honest with him, say, God, I want to know. He'll let you know. Maybe right now, maybe tomorrow, God will reveal it to you. But you have one response that's appropriate. Once you know, and if it's not that you've been worshiping him with your whole heart and it's something else, your response should be, God, I am so sorry. Humble yourself so that you can be exalted. So let's do that right now. Let's just pray. Father, God, I thank you that you are gentle and kind towards us. Even in revealing us right now and laying bare our hearts before you, you don't do that to beat us up and to shame us and to point out yet another thing that we messed up. Your convicting work is to draw us near to you. And so, God, we receive this correction. God, we ask for forgiveness for our sins. Whether we realized we were doing them or not, Lord, we do not want to live a life of opposition, a life of dismissal, or a life of indifference towards you. Absolute, complete worship is what you deserve. You are the only king. And so, God, we ask that you would help us. You never call us to do something that you don't equip us for. You don't have high standards that we can't meet just to watch us fail. You walk with us every step of the way to lead and to guide. And so, Holy Spirit, as you have called us to be holy and to live lives surrendered to you, we thank you in advance that it is not by our strength, but it is yours. And in our weakness, your strength is made known and made perfect and clear. And so, God, we ask you, as we turn to you yet again, to fill us up, strengthen our hearts, clarify our vision. And God, would you refine our resolve towards you? We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy in our lives. Undeserved and yet freely given. We give you the honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Guys, listen, the thing I love about this is God doesn't force us to jump through a bunch of hoops to come back to him. You may have spent years running from God, but in an instant you can be back in full grace and full relationship with him. That's what I love about God. He doesn't, if you spend a year and a half running from him, he doesn't require a year and a half plus one day of you surrendering for him to accept you back. We have confidence that if we ask for forgiveness, that our Father has heard us that we have been forgiven because of the sacrifice of Jesus. So that means if you ask for forgiveness, you are walking out of this room today completely forgiven of your past, forgiven of your sin, and you are walking out under the mercy and the grace of God. I love that. I love that. One thing real quick before you go. Uh, we have not this next Sunday coming up, but the following Sunday, um, the last Sunday in December, our water baptisms as a part of our Elevate worship service. Water baptism, for those of you who may not know, is what we are called to do as our next step after being coming saved. Now, ideally, it should happen right away. You get saved, you go get baptized, but sometimes we insert a bunch of time into there. <laughs> when life happens, you know, disobedience happens, whatever. And so this is your next opportunity to get baptized. And for those of you who have never been baptized, literally, you have no excuse at this point. It's time to get baptized. Because if you choose not to, you're walking in disobedience to God's word. And we don't want that. that. That's the whole thing I've been talking about the whole time. Remove your crown, bow before the Lord. It's God, not my will, but yours be done fully and immediately I will obey you. And so with baptisms coming up, if you would like to get baptized or you would like more information on it, please either fill out a communication card in the seat in front of you and put it into the boxes throughout the room. Or for those of you online, go to card.radiantcoast.org, fill that out. One of our pastoral team will get back with you this week. We'll explain it to you. Make sure you feel comfortable with your decision. And what this means is, is you're just taking your next step of obedience. 
As someone that gets baptized, you're identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You are proclaiming to your church family, and really for that matter, the world around you, that you are saved, you are set free, and you're a follower and disciple of Jesus, and you are making this thing public. And so if you've never done that, or if you've done it, but you didn't understand why you're doing it, or a bunch of things happen, and you just feel it's time for you to get baptized again, now is the time to do it. Now is the time for obedience. And so please, would you consider signing up for that and allowing God to move through you as you are obedient to him?